Yeah, so no, thanks for your, uh, having me so much. It's glad to be here. Uh, first time I've done a, uh, a first virtually, but yes, you know, I've had a lot of um, great experience at first in the past. Appreciate you guys, um, you know, inviting me and having me and allowing me to talk here. Um, very excited. And the first did uh, Miami uh, back in 2010. I met a lot of uh, great folks there, including some people that I uh, started Velexity with, um, you know, in 2016. I actually gave a presentation, uh, ironically enough, called um, APT in an exchange environment um, in Seoul at the main event there. Um, and that was, uh, you know, kind of like a, I would say it's a precursor to this, um, but here we are talking about a, a similar uh, product and, and type of behavior, um, you know, a little bit later. I mean, that had been met a lot of great people, including, um, you know, a, a late, uh, you know, Jonathan Kleinsma, um, he was a researcher that I got to see uh, present for the first time and meet him in person myself at that conference. So you know, I've met a lot of great people and friends over the years, and I'm glad to be here virtually and also look forward to the future, um, you know, in-person events again. So thanks again. Um, and today we're going to talk about uh, a lot of things uh, related to exchange, of which I believe, um, you know, uh, probably everyone has heard or, or, you know, whether it's on the news or they've had too much of it, uh, we're going to give you a little bit more. Uh, we're kind of going to go in some of the, the story in the background around um, Velexity's um, involvement, my involvement in uh, one of the kind of most uh, exciting or biggest vulnerabilities since uh, our security issues in SolarWinds. Um, and that's what I uh, plan to talk about here now. So, and then just a little bit of quick background for um, folks that aren't familiar with Sun Velocity, um, the company we work at, um, we kind of do a lot of digital forensics um, and incident response, and we deal a lot with, uh, you know, we deal with mundane incidents, but we also work on what we'd say is rather interesting incidents um, that we get called into, or like in this case, that we sometimes discover um, through network security monitoring, other kind of work that we do. Um, and then we're also really big, and this kind of plays a role in how we investigate, do some of this um, on... Uh, memory forensics. So we have products that we develop in, in, for acquisition and analysis um, and our team runs like the volatility project. Um, and we're kind of really big on doing memory analysis uh, in addition to typical digital forensics. Um, as a company and as an individual myself, I um, work with a lot of different organizations that are like huge targets of cyber espionage. That's kind of why um, it's a recurring theme and a lot of the talks we give are even the presentations um, or blogs that kind of Alexity has out there um, where uh, the companies we work with, or even the individuals down to, um, you know, dissidents, uh, people working pro-democracy or freedom of speech, things along those lines. Um, we do a lot of uh, work with, um, and as a result, um, we're kind of exposed to a lot of really interesting things. And we kind of have a challenging job, um, you know, it's to prevent, detect, um, a stop, a vast array of threats of which, you know, sometimes there's no fix for, or you don't really have a good explanation of how it's occurring. Um, so I'd say it's never a dull day. Um, but you know, that's, uh, that's the type of stuff we get to do with, and it lets us uh, do presentations like this, so, uh, exciting times. Um, so our agenda is going to be kind of like a full suite of, um, you know, these exchange vulnerabilities, not just like, Hey, here's a, a technical explanation of how something happened. It's more of a, how it started, how we investigated it, um, how we dug into a bit more, how it more, how we reported it, how it morphed. Um, and kind of just has the situation just kind of progressing and, and got worse. Um, you know, it, I think kind of everyone knows where this ends up. There's kind of like a, you know, spoiler alert, obviously a lot of bad stuff happens involving exchange and web shells at the end. Um, but I think kind of if you, if you don't know this story or some of the other stuff behind it, I think this should be kind of like a fun, like walk through and kind of you know, skip through like the different things that we're able to do. Um, so you know, as you heard, Malavi know on March 2nd of uh, this year, which it feels kind of like an eternity ago now. It's only let, I guess, three, you know, actually a little over three months. So it's really not that long ago, um, but it feels like a long time. Um, Microsoft released, uh, you know, four out of band patches for Microsoft Exchange you know, running from versions, you know, 2013, 2016, and 2019, which uh, means these vulnerabilities impacted kind of any recent version of Microsoft Exchange. So, you know, 2019 being the most recent, 2016 still pretty heavily used, and I'd say 2013, um, you know, obviously quite old at that point, but still around. Um, but the security issues did not actually um, impact Exchange 2010 or like, you know, 2003 or excuse me, 2007. So if you had these really old versions of Exchange and you didn't patch for 11 years or you didn't patch for, you know, you know 14 years, 
uh, theoretically you were secure or more secure from these issues, but, you know, probably have other problems related to security and, you know, patch management and asset management, but you know, you, you're good from these, but if you were kind of anywhere uh, recent, um, this was a pretty detrimental and pretty serious set of issues. So two of the vulnerabilities in particular um, that have the asterisks there, um, those are the two that, uh, essentially that we worked on Velixity was kind of involved with um, we had credit not for dis, you know not for um, you know, being the ones who researched and found them but for discovering them you know in the wild and kind of seeing them you know actually finding them first being used against clients um, and these two vulnerabilities we end up getting kind of chained together um, to kind of cause the most you know wild set of breaches or kind of like the most I don't know exciting set of activities since solar winds you know so a lot of things have happened in a really short period of time that are um, pretty newsworthy, pretty widespread, and, um, you know, all have this kind of espionage and, um, you know, bad activity type flair. Um, and we kind of will note that those two vulnerabilities that we have asterisk there are also discovered and reported um, by DevCore, a Taiwanese um, security company. Um, you know, many know Orange Sai on, on Twitter. Um, he, he reported those, his team reported those back on June 5th, or excuse me, January 5th. Um, and there's also, you know, obviously there's an interesting timeline about a lot of things of when they were used, when they were in the wild, when they kind of um, blew up. I'm not really going to get into that today. I'm glad to maybe answer questions if they come up on it. Um, but, you know, that's a whole other kind of interesting, you know, timeline and conversation as well. And you can read some of that on his proxy logon um, .com website. So how did it all start? Um, from our perspective, so this is us, this is our velocity. How did we get involved and how did we end up like finding all of this, um, you know, kind of this debacle that you know, unfolded? Um, it started for us in late January. So, you know, we're talking about something that was disclosed and patched out of band on March 2nd. Um, here we are on January 25th, January 26th, the end of January. Um, and what do we see? Uh, we have network security monitoring at one of our customers. They're a fairly big target. Um, and we kind of pick up something that shows that uh, a fairly large amount of data um, was leaving their exchange server. Um, and, you know, this is kind of like a summarized total byte count, but, you know, the, the flow of where the data was going was leaving the exchange server. Um, and, you know, in general, exchange is a very busy system. A lot of data comes out of exchange servers, especially if you're actually using it for email, not just in a hybrid approach for certain activity. Um, and we kind of noted this and said, hey, that's, um, you know, that's a, a good amount of data leaving the exchange server. And it basically caused a, an initial alarm bell to go off to where we need to go take a look. And it's the reason that we go um, and start looking a little deeper. And what you see in there is basically in a four and a half minute period, um, we have nearly, I'd say close to a gig of data leaving. Um, and that's not the full amount of traffic. This is what fits in this slide. Um, and this is kind of where we started off. So we have, and, and what's kind of interesting, what tips us off to say, hey, maybe we should go look a little closer, um, you know, even though it's kind of X'd out. Um, the source IP address is from a, a hosting provider. It's a, a VPS. Um, it's a place that's not a like residential network where you would expect, say, hey, um, a home user is connecting in from. Um, so this causes a little more kind of uh, interest and piques our interest to go take a look. So a lot of our customers, we have really either access to the logs directly or we can connect to the systems and pull logs. Um, this one is no exception to that rule. Um, when we go in and we pull their IS logs, which um, anything that comes into an exchange server, whether that's your phone through ActiveSync, um, your Outlook client, um, webmail, it all goes through IIS at the end of the day and all the connections and activity is like logged there. So that's kind of the first place that we went um, to take a look at what was happening. And this is a snippet that matches back to the flow that you saw on the previous slide, where we have IS log showing you know, our malicious IP address, the thing, or you know, potentially malicious IP address, uh, you know, connecting in, and it's making post requests to these, you know, GIF files, TTF, EOT, PNG files, um, and that's kind of like what we immediately find when we look at the log. So. Great source of place, good, great source to look, uh, paying off already. Um, but now you know, have a lot of question marks. So all these requests are going to legitimate files in this OWA auth and um, current themes resources, which is basically a directory that usually has like fonts, JavaScript, um, CSS, et cetera, for building like webmail. So when you go to webmail, you, you know, you have all the, the windows, the images, the themes, that's where it all comes from. Um, and as we look at the files that are in that log file. Um, you know, we already recognize some of them. They're legitimate files. I mean, there's no reason a JavaScript file, a CSS file, and things like that should really, um, you know, cause any kind of crazy concern. Um, and one thing to mention on this slide is that their user agent kept like changing. So it's a Baidu Spider, Yahoo, 
um, you know, Facebook, you know, we have a kind of like rotating set of user agents, which also is a, you know, a little bit odd as well. Um, but, you know, the files they're requesting are legitimate, but they're making post requests. And you might think, hey, this is some weird broken scanner. There's something odd going on. But remember, we're looking at this because we're seeing, you know, gigs of data leaving. So the two things are not, you know, corresponding. A, a, a 9 KB JavaScript file being requested once isn't going to cost, you know, 400 megs of data to come out. At least it shouldn't. So all the flows are intact here, you know, about 85 requests we got in total. Um, we added all up in about 15 minutes. Uh, it was about two gigs of data. So this is kind of like not a normal thing in general. Um, if a user first sets up like an Outlook client, it might go download all their emails. So that is theoretically something that could happen, um, but you wouldn't expect it to a VPS. Um, and yeah, so it's a, it's a decent chunk of data. It's not something that happens, you know, typically. Usually, email clients connect in and just get the email since the last time that they connected in. Um, and then we start to walk that backwards. So we say, okay, so now we have this pattern. We know what we're looking for. We see some things. Um, and we can say, hey, this has actually been going on um, on a lesser scale, not as frequent, you know, not as large byte transfer since January 3rd. Um, and that's just interesting. Like I said, we're not going to get into it, but remember that date of all this being reported for the first time to Microsoft was January 5th. So we have this kind of activity going back further than, you know, it was really believed to have been known or reported, you know, you know to Microsoft. And at that point, it wasn't in the wild. That was in a research capacity. So our initial reaction um, is that this is a server compromise. So, you know, you said hey, we gave him previously, we've had a lot of experience dealing with exchange servers, different breaches. So the previous first presentation was about was APT in an exchange environment. It is a, a system or a series of systems that uh, when a threat actor gets in, they love to go to and try and use for persistence, expel data, all these different things. Um, so that's kind of what we're thinking here is like, hey, this really doesn't make sense. It's a rootkit. It could be something where uh, special requests to these files are being intercepted through a um, like an HP module or an ISAPI filter or something like that, or just, you know, even some more advanced rootkit on the system. So we get memory from the system. He said we're big on memory. Um, and we grab the standard artifacts. So we're getting the page files, you know, the MFT event logs, registry, you know, the bunch of other things that we get that kind of like help you investigate um, a system. You know, we're not a, a disk image here yet. We're getting the things that we know we want to look at first and parse. Um, and then we also pull the full exchange install and kind of even the temporary ASP.NET folders. Um, and this is kind of, you know, we'd kind of been involved in a lot of the solar wind stuff back in July of 2020, um, where, you know, hey, we, we're going to, we're going to kind of uncover it looking at maybe this is a supply chain cover, maybe this is something um, even more advanced than all of this, and we're just going to kind of turn over every stone that we can. And we really look over all this data, um, you know, we would, not that we would try, you know, we would only give a, a half effort normally or anything, but they were like even more, um, like inspired to go dig in as like what would be causing this. Um, obviously compromised customers, big deal as well. Um, and we look for code injection, weird anomalies, you know, just anything that would stand out, whether it was in memory, um, logs, any of this data, um, we just absolutely come up with nothing other than what we've seen already, logs showing stuff that's not right. But we have nothing on the system that explains it, nothing that's like, injected, nothing loaded, no kernel modules, you know, no, no file recently written um, into the exchange activity, web.configs haven't been modified. And, and we kind of just looked everywhere we could um, and, and you know, outside the box. So then we also dug in a bit more because um, now we have these user agents, we have um, the paths that they're hitting, which are kind of like non-standard, these URLs, um, and even some of the IP addresses. And we find out that we have a second customer um, that's a victim. You know, the first reaction is like, okay, what's the common denominator here? Exchange. And you're a little nervous. Hey, well, we also work with both of these places. Um, you know, so they, you know, these thoughts kind of go through your mind. You're a little, you know, hey, we, what's going on here? Um, but we've been doing a very thorough investigation on this and we start to think, hey, maybe this is an exploit. And that's kind of, you know, we didn't actually jump there. That is not remotely our first thought when we came in. We thought for sure um, breach organization, uh, maybe something else, maybe even a supply chain thing that moved the exchange servers. But as we kind of dug in a bit more and looked at the different infrastructures and the visibility and the different logging we had, we just really started to think, hey, I don't think this involves a backdoor server. Um, it might be an exploit. So we know something's going on, but we don't exactly know what. And we have to kind of tell our customers, right? We're like, hey, we think we know something bad and weird is going on, but we really don't know what. Um, so we don't really have a solution for you. And it's not a conversation that we normally like. It's not a conversation we normally have at all. Um, and it's an awkward one to have because um, you don't want to look bad, but you also obviously don't know what's happening at this point. And you know, this stuff has to be getting stolen because it just doesn't, the math just doesn't add up otherwise. Um, 
So we could say, hey, um, kind of worked with a couple of those customers. Um, we said, hey, can we develop a plan to kind of dig into this? You know, obviously you could blow the server away and you could start fresh, um, you know, but one of them was like fully patched and showed no signs of compromise. Um, and kind of both were worked with us, we know real well, and they were very interested in saying, hey, well, let's take your idea and let's see um, how we might figure out what's going on. Because now we have logs saying there's some regularity to this activity occurring. One is having it every three to four days. Other customers, like every, it could be every four to eight days, you know, not quite as frequent, but we know, hey, if we lay a trap or we come up with a plan, um, if I just go off of the last month, I'm only between 24 and, you know, 72 hours away from something potentially happening. Um, so with the one customer, we're able to do kind of like a real-time alerting. Uh, well, with both we can, but our plan is, hey, we're going to go grab memory as quickly as we can. So maybe we can get this even while it's occurring and we'll have more of a chance that something interesting is going on, free space. We'll be able to actually capture like the actual request. So it'll still be around. Um, and the other one, they actually, uh, the one that's targeted less frequently, um, we actually have an option with them to do um, a proxy shim from the internet before it hits their exchange server. So we actually set up um, some logging so that, hey, if anything matches this pattern, which is that post request to the OWA auth current folder, we're going to capture the full headers as well as the payload. So everything in that HTTP request. So whatever they're doing, we'll capture it. Um, obviously, that's a little bit more detailed plan, um, but it's at the place that's targeted a little bit less. Well, and then we execute on it. Um, it actually only took a couple of days. Uh, the customer that is targeted more frequently, uh, we get a, an alert for it and we're actually able to capture memory very quickly. Um, but it doesn't have everything we want. But what we do see when we go through memory in the free space, we can find the attacker's request because obviously it stands out very specific URLs. Um, and we actually get some of the HTTP headers around it, but we don't have the post data that it's sending. Um, but what we see here in the bottom is like what we initially found. Um, this X anon resource backend cookie um, is being passed. And it actually has this coming from the bad guy in a post request um, to a like a font file or things like that. But in their cookie, they have the internal exchange server of their backend server. So set up in the DAG, there's like a multi um, exchange server setup. And they have the name and the local domain of this victim's um, exchange server uh, in that cookie. And then the other cookie, BE resource. Um, that B resource cookie has the um, front end exchange server in it with the ho with the, the domain name in it. Um, and actually has a URL related to downloading email. So exchange.asmx uh, is the exchange web services, EWS endpoint, um, where it can do many different things of which downloading and reading email is like one of the main functions or main things that it's kind of used for. And we can see this. So it's starting to add up or say, hey, something's odds going on. They're making this multi request, they know internal host name, and they're hitting a URL that involves uh, an endpoint that you might be able to like download email from. But, you know, we're still kind of looking into this and we're trying to figure this out and we don't have all the pieces, but it's starting to kind of come together a little bit. Um, at the same time, we also kind of, we kind of saw this before, but we also kind of start mapping it up in the logs. Um, I don't expect people to like look at this and necessarily um, go through every line and explain that I was kind of say at a high level, these two exchange servers, we have one request that resulted in three log lines, which that's kind of interesting, right? We have these different cookie values. They're showing up um, in the, the URL or the URI patterns. Um, and most notably, if you look at the first log line there and the last bolded item, we can see that this authentication coming in to request email or you know at least hit exchange.asmx is authenticated against the using the computer account of that backend exchange server. So we're now seeing that a, a request comes inbound on OWA and it starts bouncing around against the exchange servers and ultimately results in what looks like a request potentially for email coming from the computer account um, of the actual exchange server. So one request starts resulting in a bunch of things bouncing around between the servers. So that starts to stand out as being, uh, yeah, definitely something is uh, not adding up right. And these attackers are obviously doing something, you know, kind of interesting here. Um, fortunately, to kind of really piece it together and I guess uh, spoon feed us the answer <laughs> was the, uh, the, the proxy shim that we put in. Uh, a short time later after that, we ended up, the other customer was targeted. Um, our attackers came in and they exploited basically the same thing. And we can see over here on that victim, hey, they got the same cookies and highlighted. Um, and we captured the payload. Um, and the payload ended up just being a um, typical SOAP request. You can go look examples online, say, hey, if I want to go download email um, from Exchange, I'm going to craft my own SOAP request. Uh, this is exactly what it looks like, or you know, very similar. It's kind of like what you'd expect. There's no specific exploit or magic 
in the SOAP request. And it's actually just formulated to say, hey, this user SID, that's the identifier um, for a particular user um, in their mailbox. And this request started off by saying, hey, tell me all the items that are in their inbox. Um, and then it was followed on with, you know, additional requests that basically started downloading all of those objects, which would include emails and their attachments. So kind of what we were starting to think, what would account for this byte transfer? Well, now we have the exact answer what was going on. So what have we found here? Um, in this case, this is Hafnium. So Microsoft, you know, named this third actor Hafnium. You know, we, did, we just had this kind of disparate activity. Uh, we didn't have a name for it. We actually did suspect um, this potentially being a Chinese APT group um, based off of some uh, browsing traffic the attackers ended up doing that was unrelated to their exploitation, where we saw their accept language and a couple other things that they did, um, but it could be a complete, you know, black flag operation. Um, but they named Hafnium as a Chinese APT group that they had tracked and had some history on. Um, and what we had here is Hafnium using a zero day exploit against exchange servers um, to kind of really do a uh, what we say is it's definitely a highly targeted espionage operation. I mean, we can put cyber in front of it, but at the end of the day, they're stealing you know, emails, information, um, these victim organizations, basically trying to get in on their communications, what they're working on, what they're sending. Um, and they're doing that, um, you know, completely under the radar. So they're able to craft these special URLs um, to, you know, uh, go through OWA. Um, and it's back to that, like, kind of log file. What they do is they're tricking, this is a server-side request forgery. Um, they cause the front-end server to ask the back-end server, you know, hey, it passes this along, takes those cookies, and it basically causes the request to bounce around, ultimately causing that backend exchange server um, to, you know, on behalf of our attacker with no password, no authentication data, um, ask for email and say, hey, I need the email for this user. I want to pull all, all these content. And it kind of like shuffles it all back and forth. So the that request is authenticated because it's coming from the computer account. That's what an exchange server is supposed to do except for it was kicked off and initiated by an attacker who had absolutely, you know, no authentication and no knowledge about that user's password. So that's the kind of the beauty and the trick of it all is they just fooled the whole exchange server environment into making all these different requests um, and, you know, siphoning off the email where they didn't have any special knowledge or data about the, like, the end user. So we kind of said this is like the nearly perfect crime. And obviously they got caught. Um, and, you know, at some point it was probably going to get patched anyway, you know, it was, uh, reported, you know, this, this vulnerability, this issue had a clock on it of, of some kind, um, but no one knew that this was being exploited in the wild. And here we are, um, you know, finding out that Hafnium can just take a, uh, an email address, basically, or who they want, and they know where an exchange server is, and they can just start, you know, siphoning off this data. They can just sort of pull it down. Um, so people kind of say, hey, what about endpoint security, antivirus? It was a really perfect crime. It's under the radar. Um, you know, basically the answer is yes, there's nothing that they were doing um, that would flag endpoint security, right? They're not writing files to disk, they're not executing commands, there's no parent-child relationship of processes that are doing anything strange, they're not like dumping credentials, they, they aren't doing anything out of the ordinary and from an exchange and from a computer's perspective, it's just doing exchange tasks. There's no buffer overflow, there's no weird text, um, you know, it's what they do. And obviously, you know, hindsight 2020, we now have ways to detect or, or find these things, but it's not something like an antivirus or EDR um, is or would alert on. Um, and it's, you know, it's fairly, un, un, you know, it's extremely under the radar. It doesn't really make much noise. Obviously, you know, we have a bit, what I'll say is you know, admittedly a combination of some of the work we do, um, but also a bit of luck, right? So this early set of been happening, you know, earlier and going under the radar, but they were also doing it on a kind of like a smaller scale. Um, and they eventually tipped something that made us go look. Um, so, but, you know, completely under the radar, not much noise at all, um, and just a low and slow operation to come in periodically to pull down, you know, emails. So what we do is back at our lab, our team, you know, at Velexity, um, we start testing that exploit, right? You know, we kind of had started poking around and testing, um, but once we had that um, proxy shim data, you know, it was basically at this point, it's like copy and paste, you know exactly what to do. This is not a hard thing to recreate. Uh, I mean, obviously we had some tweaks and tricks and, and, and you know, scripting it up properly um, was a little bit complicated, um, but we had a script that we called Marauder. Um, we have a video of this on our blog that we did about this, or if you kind of want to watch it like in motion, um, we got our team Josh wrote up um, where basically uh, we pointed an exchange server. Um, you say what email you want um, and it goes in and just grabs and downloads all the email. So we kind of made sure we weren't crazy, right? So, Hey, we, we see what they're doing, but, could there still be some kind of weird backdoor that's allowing all this? So obviously in our lab, you know, we set up our own exchange server, you know, fully patched, completely up to date. Um, we're able to reproduce 
Um, and we tested it with some, you know, authorization against some of those customers, verified it, and we had it working in multiple different environments. Um, it's a little bit trickier to get it to work in a non-DAG environment, like a single standalone server, but kind of got this working um, in DAG and non-DAG environments. Um, and then basically pretty right after we were able to kind of figure out and get this working, um, we reached out and reported this SSRF to Microsoft. Um, and that's where the waiting game began, right? So, you know, we're, hey, we reported this, not the first thing we reported to Microsoft over the years, um, but it's kind of in the more interesting, um, pretty wild category for us. I'd say you've seen a lot of zero days and a lot of interesting things. I can't say like, you know, is one better or worse than the other? I'm not a vulnerability researcher. Um, so I can't say like how hard or difficult this was to discover, but it's a pretty very interesting vulnerability and the impact and the way it was used, I would say, and not to be at all in someone doing espionage, but it kind of in all of like, wow, this is pretty interesting and very under the radar, like we said. So kind of took like the next we kept perfected our version. You know, the first one was like, oh, you know, circum circumstances. Then we just kind of like really dumbed it down. It was like very point and click. And we continue to reach, you know, work with MSRC and share this with them. And say, hey, we're, it's a little bit nerve wracking from our perspective because you have this whole limited targeted attacks, right? But like this could be used at any point, at any time, you know, against anyone running exchange to the internet, which admittedly is a lot less now than it was say five or six years ago, but it's pretty widespread. And there's a lot of companies still still use it. Um, you know, and now it's Velexity, we could just pick a company. And if we knew an email address, we could go download their email. I mean, it's great if we wanted to do a, you know, a pen test or something during this time using this vulnerability. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we want this patched like as quickly as possible, like anybody else. Um, and we're sitting there with trying to come up with unofficial mitigations with proxy blocks or different things to put in place and test with the customers to kind of, you know, mitigate this. But even then we're like, I don't know, you know, this is one attack method, the only way in. And it turns out it necessarily wasn't, but yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting time here. So I'm going to kind of leap forward. Um, so we know that to be the SSRF. So that's not what got us to what we call this you know, global cyber pandemic, right? So that's really bad in itself, right? So if I can go anywhere, if I can go anywhere, just download email and conduct espionage at will with literally knowing almost no information about uh, an end user or an organization beyond their exchange server and their email address, uh, that's really bad. That's horrible. I think that's noteworthy. That's newsworthy. Um, but obviously, we know things got worse than that and a lot more widespread and not that limited targeted attacks that you always read about in the byline of a vulnerability um, or security advisory. So in late February, um, we detected what we still be, excuse me, still believe to be Hafnium um, putting a China chopper web shell. So then one line chopper shell lets them like run commands and basically, um, you know, do anything they want on a system, you know, by way of interacting with a, an ASP.NET web shell on an exchange server. Um, they use this to then write another shell we call sports ball. Um, you can read about it on our, on our blog, um, but basically it's a shell. We believe they kind of lifted from a dump online from APT 34, which is, um, you know, Iranian APT. And this is, we don't think there's any correlation or collaboration. It's just something, uh, that they use for whatever reason. Um, we saw a variety of web shells over the time. Um, but that's what they wrote to disc. Um, and you know, we caught this as it's happening. Um, but we didn't know how they managed it, right? So at this point, all we had seen is this um, SSR app that would let you uh, read emails, right? Or, or take actions against uh, EWS. You could, you know, maybe you could set a meeting invite or change, you know, the other or, or send an email, but obviously reading email being the most espionage and kind of dangerous component of it. Um, so this is an alarming, you know, escalation of tactics from our point of view, right? This is like a complete different ball game. Um, and now this changes things in terms of, what is the impact potentially to an organization, um, you know, in their entire network, their whole system, their domain, their passwords, and so forth. Um, that ended up being CVE 2021-27065. Um, so we had a good handle on what the attackers were doing, kind of like in real time, like watching them, we know what they're running, we know what they're doing, um, but we don't know how they got there. Um, and we're on the phone with a customer at this point, someone we know very well. Um, and kind of what we say, what we say next is I, I kind of enjoy telling this story and also somewhat sometimes kind of a not proud or embarrassed of it at the same time, because it's uh, it goes against everything in theory you would normally recommend, but we tell them, Hey, we can delete these files. We can remove this. We see what they're doing. Um, but we don't know how that web shell got there. And we are super interested in how someone just went from an SSRF to, you know, writing a file to disk and doing things. And do you have interest in learning that with us? Um, so you can shut the server down. That's the right course of action. Um, that's what we would typically recommend, but we believe they haven't progressed this further. Um, we can take actions to learn together. 
uh, they were fully on board with that, uh, knowing the consequences and potential issues going on. Um, like I said, uh, mostly proud of this. Uh, but we said, hey, we have full packet capture, but uh, for many years now, you know, if you're familiar with perfect forward secrecy, Diffie Hellman, like there's, it doesn't matter that we have the private key to your exchange server, we cannot decrypt this traffic, so we can't see what they're doing. So remove these web shells and we work together to downgrade uh, the security of their server, which is that it's not something we would typically recommend, but this uh, was a very interesting case that had, uh, you know, how else are we going to figure this out? There's not, there's no time, you know, this thing needs to go offline ASAP. There's no putting in a proxy or some magic way where we can kind of intercept this data in between. This is the only fix we can have. So theoretically, if we downgrade security and intercept that traffic, we can now decrypt it. So turns out that strategy um, fully worked. Uh, it is a, as I said, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this at home, uh, but you know, we weren't too worried about uh, someone along the way intercepting email and, and this making things worse. Uh, we were more concerned about trying to figure out what's going on here and having these answers. And you know, like I said, they were on board and what they're getting into. Um, and we did, we decrypted the network traffic. We you know, kind of basically kicked the bad guys out while they were you know, just start getting started. Um, and made them basically start over. So, you know, in order to rewrite those web shells and do all the again, they'd have to re-exploit the server. Um, we kind of figured they were on the hook. Uh, we weren't wrong. Um, and that's how we kind of captured the next uh, vulnerability being exploited. So what we found in this case was happening was kind of chaining that initial SSRF. So the thing where they can trick the exchange server into making requests amongst itself. Um, and then they had this like very complicated set of activities they did next. Um, and this is basically what uh, DevCore calls the proxy logon. You know, if you kind of go read about that vulnerability and that series of things. And what they did using the SSRF and auto, made an auditor auto discovery request um, to get the legacy DN value for the administrator user. Um, and you might hear like, hey, this vulnerability wouldn't work if they didn't know the username of an administrator. Well, a lot of people in their domain don't change them. I mean, they might change the account, they might not use it, but a lot of times that username is administrator and it's there by default, probably in most places. Um, or they could try to figure out what a, a domain admin or some highly privileged account was, but administrator is there in most places. They get that legacy DN value. Um, they hit this other endpoint um, using that to get the SID. So now that I have this legacy DN value, I can hit one of these mappy endpoints and I can now turn that to get the SID, you know, the SID for the account, the thing that we showed earlier in that SOAP request. Then they connect a the proxy logon basically to get a valid session cookie. And now they have all of these things, this SSR vulnerability, this series of requests and a cookie. And now they have cleared the way to uh, use a zero day exploit against um, the virtual directory settings. So in this case, you heard a lot about OAB virtual directory, but it didn't necessarily have to be the OAB virtual directory. It can be any directory, but it turns out if you set the external URL for an OAB virtual directory, no one's gonna notice, no one cares, it wouldn't impact operations. Um, and basically the attackers chained a series of vulnerabilities together um, you know, to be able to exploit that and write a web shell that disk and ultimately get RCE. Um, I kind of tell people, hey, interesting thing is that vulnerability with the virtual directory, it's, it, it exists in a vacuum. It's there. It's its own vulnerability. But this entire thing would never have made the news if it wasn't for that SSRF, because to otherwise exploit or set that virtual directory, the you know, person would have had to have been an exchange administrator working credentials with an exchange admin to be able to exploit this. But now with that SSRF, not so much. You just basically need to know that Exchange server, um, a working domain admin account or a privilege account, and follow this pattern. So they chain two things together to basically make um, a pretty impressive and ultimately horrific dumpster fire of like vulnerabilities. So um, we had more victims. So between kind of like 25th of February um, and 28th of February, very end of February, uh, we gained with two other people who were given special attention, right? These are places that actually had real activity. Um, Hafnium, you know, one was a Hafnium target, um, the other uh, was a victim of the same ex exchange zero day, but we don't believe them to be Hafnium. So we're talking like before this was really out there and known, Hafnium using this to kind of exploit and kind of do, inter you know, actual operations against an organization, uh, and also seeing this from what we think is another threat group. So we also start to see a bunch of probing against auto discovery during this time, pretty widespread, people we would not expect to be um, targets of any APT or Chinese APT in particular. Um, and we kind of reported these new details to Microsoft and kind of escalated this. So we kind of, we started ringing alarm, uh, ringing alarm bells a lot wider at this point. Um, and this is kind of like about the time and just before this really kicked off pretty widespread and people were, you know, seeing it kind of more uh, globally. <coughs> so intrusion, but kind of with no patch in sight, um, you know, at this point we're working 
multiple intrusions with chain zero days. Um, and kind of what we see next, and like we really don't give a lot of uh, credence to this or a lot of uh, put this in the put a lot of this in the presentation is you know what the attackers did next. The attackers did what attackers do, right? They, you know, you have a web shell, you have to write a web shell to disk. That's potentially noisy in itself. There's EDR solutions and products are flagging at this point. Um, but the bad guy has to still do something, right? They need to they need to move laterally, they need to move the other systems, need to dump credentials. I um, mean, they're in a privileged account, right? So having Having this type of access and exchange server is basically an invitation to be a domain admin or other privileged thing because your service accounts and all these things, it's, it's a great place to be. At minimum, you get user passwords and persistence. Um, but attackers basically use Mimikatz, um, don't process space for LSAS in one way or another, um, or run tools once they get credentials to kind of get the ntds.dit from you know, the Active Directory. They move around the typical means. I mean, kind of like what we see on, um, you know, in terms of how the attackers move around what they did, it, it's not something you haven't seen and we haven't seen for 10 plus years. I mean, the, the comm services yell thing is a, a more recent trick and things like that, but it kind of just did everything um, like the typical. Uh, one interesting thing is, <coughs> excuse me, is that the persistence still in most of these cases were more web shells, either in other places on the exchange server or um, in some of the places we work with moving to other, you know, whether it's a, um, an Apache server or Windows server or something else, putting web shells other places in the organization. We didn't see a lot of like now. We didn't see plug X, didn't see different tools, um, at least not at this stage. Um, and that was just the beginning. Like I said, we started seeing these different scans for auto discover, um, you know, kind of really picked up on February 27th. Uh, these scan, you know, go look in the logs. Pretty much anyone who runs an exchange server probably saw something along these lines. Um, these are the initial uh, in, entry points using ecpy.js um, to test the auto discover. Basically, someone went around scanning saying, hey, is there an administrator user? um on all of these different exchange servers basically setting the stage to come in um, and do wide exploit uh, widespread exploitation so interesting for us on monday um march 1st we were still being told and you know maybe i didn't mention this earlier that the expected patch for this for all these exchange issues was march 9th so that was the actual planned patch tuesday remember this is when out of band um and then we got word like hey um, this is getting bumped up um, I'm sure other people reported it, but we kind of, you know, we, we'd reached out to different uh, government agencies. We'd reached out to Microsoft, sharing all this thing they're seeing, the escalation, the additional scanning. Um, and even at this point, we didn't really know how widespread and bad it had become in terms of the non-targeted capacity. But we're saying, hey, we're seeing all these things. Um, and Microsoft bumped it up. Obviously, they weren't like, oh, Alexa, you told us to do an out of band, so we got to do it. But I think like with the stuff we gave them and other people were reporting, um, it kind of pushed things. And I'm sure people there had to work like overnight. Uh, we're already doing that till then. I mean, I'm sure it's no easy feat. I mean, obviously we all wish patch could come out in January or February 3rd, you know, the day after reporting on February 2nd, but that's, you know, it's not reality. But um, so we find out that out of band's coming um, and that's great. But in kind of all these, you know, details about this vulnerability is exploitation. Um, we published it at the same time as Microsoft kind of coordinated the, the outreach and the, the posting at the same time once the patch was available. Um, and kind of the advice was, hey, organizations that can't patch this right away or anytime soon, you know, cut off your exchange services. And <clears throat> to be honest, that's what we had been advising our customers leading up to this. Like, hey, you need to, uh, you could try these fixes that we have um, to block things that we don't know 100%. But if you can't, um, you know, if you don't do that, you may want to consider, we're already saying consider blocking these services. We had some people that cut it off, um, just knowing that they could be potential targets. Uh, Microsoft also released some PowerShell scripts and tools to look for compromise, um, and there was a lot to be found. Um, but as we know, the kind of the interesting part of this story and what I think a lot of the issues with vulnerability and security things that get out there when people apply patches, it's like, oh, they're patched, it's in the wild, whatever. Um, they're like, I'm, I'm safe now. But we other people pretty much like in the security industry, I think the message you got across really well was that, hey, wide widespread exploitation started before that patch was available. So even if on 4 p.m. Eastern time um, or 4.05 or you know, however long the patch takes to apply, it's not a quick patch and requires a reboot. Um, you know, even if you apply basically right away, there was multiple days of wide indiscriminate exploitation. So not just this, uh, hey, um, you know, hearing limited targeted attacks is never a comforting thing if you're one of the people actually being targeted. It turns out the attacks weren't limited at all, nor were they targeted once they got really widespread. Um, so the patches would stop new exploitation, but they would do nothing to help um, the people that have the web shell sitting there on their servers, because we kind of saw simultaneous campaigns, right? Um, clearly, from our perspective, bad guys had wind and knew or otherwise, you know, had an inkling that this vulnerability was about to come to an end. I don't know that they knew, hey, out of band patch Tuesday was coming, 
but they knew that the, the, the clock was ticking on this and they basically hit go. Um, they went to places that they knew they wanted to advance, um, exploited those and got hands-on humans on keyboard um, and let the automation kind of basically do the rest is what we kind of surmise from this. And we do believe it's you know multiple different threat groups and not just half of them that was involved in this from the beginning. So we kind of say, hey, exchange admins or Tuesday night, hey, this is fine. You know, everything's burning down around them. Um, you know, maybe this is all, uh, you know, it's, it's a special month, March, you get two patch Tuesdays for the price of one. Um, it's a lot of fun. People love this type of stuff. Um, but you know, yeah, at least it's out there and there's some tools and things to look for to kind of address it. Um, and we start seeing like staggering numbers, right? The, the figures that came out ultimately said like, you know, hundreds of thousands of compromised servers, um, you know, Krebs obviously got numbers involving um, the United States that start getting reported um, saying, hey, at least 30,000 organizations in the US, hundreds of thousands of servers globally. And you're talking like widespread exploitation and huge impact of organizations that actually got hit. These aren't vulnerable. These are ones that are actually supposed to be backdoored and compromised. So, you know, investigating exchange servers. So we said, hey, that's stuff that, and, and this is where we get into the incident response part of this, you know, you know we mentioned memory dumping or the, the, the shims, but how do you investigate this stuff? And, you know, we have all these exchange servers that are potentially compromised and, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you rebooted or you patched or you don't find anything, but the thing was, hey, message with, hey, you need to go back and look, you need to go back and find out, hey, did something actually happen? Were you compromised? Were you exploited beforehand? Um, and that's really kind of like this big incident response aspect that this comes in. So investing in exchange servers, what we say here, it's kind of a bit focused on this, um, this particular case, but actually, you know, some of these things like looking at memory, I'd use that potentially in all investigations. Um, and this would be useful for uh, any type of exchange investigation and not just this particular incident. So some of the things we think are like the most useful, right? System memory, you know, I've already said that like five times. Um, IS log, we kind of touched on that a bit. Um, there's other exchange logs. So exchange actually keeps um, a crazy and amazing amount of uh, logging of different things that it captures, include those HTTP proxy requests that we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, master file table, or in this bullet tab, um, files from the exchange web directories, um, and also the ASP.NET folder is great too, um, the temporary internet files for that. Um, and event logs. So system memory, um, you know, there's a lot of things, right? Hey, I want to look for, um, you know, check the code, the processes, weird things. There's a lot of stuff you can look for. Um, but obviously in this case, you know, here's a screenshot of what the shim cache looked like from a system that had been um, victimized and given special attention. You can kind of see, hey, <laughs> and then, you know, getting this from a, a live running system is useful because, you know, the registry doesn't have this data yet because it hasn't been rebooted to write it or flush it. Um, you know, into the into the registry. So, you know, getting the shim cache out of memory um, is a useful task and exercise to kind of see stuff that had run um, that you can't get from disk. Um, and in here, you kind of see a series of things, right? You kind of almost like follow along with a lot of what the attackers did. Um, remember, the timestamps are the files last modified time and not necessarily when it was ran. Um, so those are, uh, I don't say misleading, but if you don't know that, it can kind of look a little funky or weird. But you, know, you can clearly see some things like svc host.exe run out of the Windows assembly folder, um, you know, having m.exe and Microsoft DRM server and ndmtools.temp and the PS exec running. Um, this is a place where an attacker ran a bunch of stuff and moved laterally and started bouncing around to different systems to kind of like dump other credentials and run Mimi cats and do um, you know, different things. So it's useful from that. So we always say, hey, get system memory. That's a good place to start. Volatile data, right? So if an attacker ran actual commands, you can capture it. Um, and, you know, hey, a lot of this stuff might get captured by EDR systems, um, might not, or you might not have an EDR on it. So, we, you know, kind of get that memory is a really good step. Um, the IS log. So we kind of said, hey, anything that comes in from those clients, like when we saw half the doing the SSRF vulnerability, um, you know, it's there. But also all of this exploitation is there. So all the exploitation for the web shell writing, accessing web shells, this is all gets captured um, in the IIS logs. Um, they're, you know, the paths are, you know, pretty well known, but it's, you know, the INET pub logs folder. Um, and kind of like, what do you look for, right? So um, if you've investigated like web shell and stuff, you know, you kind of like know what to look for. But in general, at a high level, hey, if I'm taking a web server, a lot of the time, but, you know, definitely on um, exchange servers, they have their INET pub, you know, ASP.NET client folder. Um, that is absolutely not used in any way, shape or form um, by exchange. So unless you have something interesting or odd going on with that exchange server, it does like multiple tasks, kind of like any ASPX file even being in there, but you know, any type of request to that should stand out. And you should be able to look and say, hey, am I getting a 200 response from a file? Even if it's not there anymore in the past, um, good idea that this could be um, something going on. Same thing as surfacing 
um, Xville, like you find a, a temple or a RAR file, a seven zip file um, in there, hey, that would be a good sign that data was stolen. Um, some of the entry points for the exploitation, um, we had those OWA directories and files we talked about, but like the widespread exploits and the stuff that came out where the URLs like x.js, y.js, z.js, program.js, you know, kind of these different URLs there. Um, and if you look for the inbound hits to that, you kind of see, hey, okay, I know um, exploitation may have been, you know, attempted, possibly successful. Um, <laughs> um, and then the last one there, say, hey, look for 200 or 206 responses to requests, um, like the OWA auth path. And you want to look for files that are kind of like not expected, right? So um, the 200 to be like, hey, there's some ASPX files that are like used by Exchange, but if I can read those out and I see these other files I didn't know about, um, that's really good. Um, and actually, the 206 responses is something that I've had in the you know said so that talk that we gave um in 2016 about when, uh, attackers do they exfil through the Exchange server, right? 206 is a partial content response. Um, so if I have like 100 you know meg rar, like a 10 gig rar in there. Um, Exchange is going to chunk that and you're going to see 206s to that file, but they might name it something like .css. So we say, hey, they call it like, you know, OWA underscore font .css, but that's really a RAR file. So looking through the system, that might not stand up. When you see a 206, like, well, why is someone downloading a CSS file and making like 50 requests to it? Well, the chances are that's like Xfil. Um, there are a couple of systems um, or files like Notify. There's a couple of MP3s that play chimes and things that might result in that. But once you weed out kind of like the usual suspects, um, it's pretty easy to kind of surface exfil and in, in data, you know, data theft, which is um, exchange servers before this were uh, a huge avenue by which that's done. Like you said, it's a very busy server. Um, after you know these attacks, they're also a big point of entry uh, as well as a point of exit. Um, so the non-IS log. So exchange servers performed like a ridiculous amount of logging. I think I mentioned um, some of those paths up there are the key ones you want to look at. Um, a few of those, like the OAB generator log, um, that's from one of the that's actually listed in Microsoft's uh, post about. Hey, one of these other, there's a couple of CVEs and vulnerabilities um, that were reported that Microsoft saw, or um, I believe a, a Danish company saw that weren't the ones that we saw, and they weren't the ones that were really widespread, but they kind of tell you, hey, here's the things to look for, um, for these vulnerabilities. You can go read, read a little bit more about, you know, what to look for, but these are the places that you'll find them. Um, the, wide, the widespread exploitation and activity, um, kind of the paths there at the bottom, right? The ECP server logs, um, you would see things like the virtual directory being set, and you would see like ASP. You'd basically see the exploit in there if it happened. And if you see that log, that likely means it was meant it was successful. Um, the HTTP proxy log too, that's like a really great log file that had um kind of answer your questions about, you know, is this an entry point? Is this proxying something? You know, like we had that one request and it made multiple. Well, it turns out that log would kind of record all that. Um, the exchange server ECP server logs, um, we say, hey, a real simple way, go grep out um, you know. Internal URL. Uh, that's actually be a lowercase i. I don't know how it got capitalized. Um, but you want case, you know, case sense insensitive, you just look at that, and um, you'll get a hits potentially like this. And you can see kind of that's a setting the OAB virtual directory and it sets the external URL. And you can see it's got basically a path to write file and a China chopper shell um, and, and a kind of like series of other things related to what the attacker did. Um, in the proxy log, if you kind of like weed out, you grab for server info with a tilde at the end and you weed out some of the JavaScript things like ECP 15 dot, you know, that might be a slightly different URL, but it'll be mostly like JavaScript files. Um, and what you're basically left with, and we've looked at this on hundreds of servers, and I don't think we've even seen a false positive on it, is things like that that you see in red. Uh, entry point was y.js, but there was a cookie that said, hey, go request autodiscover.xml. Um, and this is a case where you'd actually see what an attacker doing scanning um, and exploitation to kind of um, set up the attack. And you'd see each one of the requests as a win um, along the way. And that's a, a great way to kind of surface if you were attacked and kind of maybe did it succeed. Uh, same thing, master file table. So, you know, I know MFT, great source of kind of, uh, or if you run an FLS on like a disk of, you know, a full disk or something like that, but basically getting the master file table or some kind of accounting for um, disk artifacts, really great way too, right? So we could have these things where, hey, um, bad guy used a web shell, web shell got deleted or removed. Um, so it's like gone now, I don't have access to it, but um, you know, what was actually in it? Um, so, well, you can go in and say, okay, well, on, you know, March 1st at, o, you know, 033, 35 hours, you know, a bad guy came in. Oh, look at this. There's a, an ASPX file, a DLL file um, where the web shell got compiled. So you could go grab that DLL file and you can actually go look at it and actually see what the contents were and see, hey, was it a web shell? You can confirm what you're looking at, even if the files have been deleted um, from like the OWA auth folder or the INET, um, you know, INET pub folder. And it's a really good way to kind of be able to dig in for that. 
uh, files from directories. So uh, I'll try and uh, wrap it up here pretty quick, but um, files from web directory. So just, hey, general, like we said, hey, anything in that ASP.NET client folder, just go and look at these folders, look at the files um, that shouldn't be there. Um, or, you know, in some cases, if there's anything at all, like, hey, this ASP.NET client has an ASPX file um, or any of the subfolders underneath it, chances are that's bad. Um, you know, hey, unless you put it there or you have a specific knowledge of it, um, you know, it's something at least worth um, in investigating. So that's a good way to go check that out. Um, and then event logs. So everyone does event logs. Um, you know, hey, I will look at event logs for these for an activity. Um, but it turns out this M MS Exchange Management EBTX file, um, this records a lot of data. So when we talk about, hey, um, even the presentations, like APT and Exchange environment, attacker comes in and they export mailboxes or they set up forwarding or they do these different things. Most Exchange tasks um, of significance are, are things where administrators are doing things, whether it's through essentially the web or from like, um, the exchange management shell, which is a PowerShell interface, uh, it gets logged in this MS Exchange Management EBTX file. So the exploitation, for example, we had some people that had no, um, their their exchange logging was like really poor, they only had a couple of days, but this event log could tell us like, hey, that exploit was successful or was not successful because um, we have the logs from that, those, those you know time periods in there. Um, and it's a really good way to kind of log all that. And then you have the you know the typical ones, right? So like, hey, depending on what you're investigating, but if specific this incident, um, Defender might like, or even if you ran a script, Defender um, would stomp on some of the shells. You could look for the you know the one one five or one one six events, you know things like that where it had flagged on something and potentially deleted or quarantined it. Um, and then we find yeah, hey, just search .aspx um, when you're looking at some of these incidents across all the logs. Because like weird errors and things sometimes show up in like strange places. Uh, it's like a very basic thing. Uh, it's not like an advanced uh, analysis method by any means, but just grepping that out when you have like a web show incident. Um, sometimes you'll find like, hey, for some weird reason um, that got captured in the system log or the application log, or, you know, something happens every once in a while. I can't say in too many cases of this, but we found that to be fairly useful, you know, in the past. So just in general, what have we seen? I mean, like, we kind of say, hey, we saw that really targeted exploitation. So we saw like the uh, the super interesting stuff under the radar. We saw this advanced, you know, APT kind of moving around, but you're basically moving to your typical task, right? So, hey, wrote a web shell, they run commands, right? It's a, uh, I don't want to underscore because it's like very serious, these organizations. And it's like kind of cool to watch, but they, you know, bad guys do what bad guys do. They have to run, they have to move around. Um, and, you know, probably staying on uh, some of the research on Twitter and some people's blogs where they have more up-to-date techniques on specific things. That's where you're going to see the really interesting stuff. A lot of these hackers are just following um, some of it's kind of recent, but the typical methods for, for moving around or even proxying through networks. Um, but, you know, kind of the standard stuff, you know, web shells, um, the widespread exploitation was mostly from our perspective, setting the stage. Um, you know, we saw a handful of uh, places where attackers did follow up and either wrote more web shells or we have seen, um, you know, some crypto mining, some ransomware related stuff, you know, kind of it's like a smattering of that, right? So anything you come up with a bad guy would do, um, it, it, it happened. Um, it kind of interestingly um, is widespread scanning by security researchers, governments, um, and we've even seen attackers, right? So one interesting thing I think to underscore, and you know, we always use this example, um, back in 2015, 2016, we saw APT29 um, do this, where they went and some of the infrastructure they used were compromised um, cold fusion servers. Well, it turns out that some like a kind of like a, an IRC bot and some other stuff, uh, you know, used for IRC bot and some other stuff, um, uh, like a criminal actor had scanned cold fusion with a vulnerability and they left a file called h.cfm across a ton of servers. If you knew that file was there, it is the same password to interact with as a file upload tool. Um, it was the same, same like way of interacting with it across all the servers. So if you knew h.cfm existed and you knew what it was, you also had backdoor access to the ABT29 used that and from what we've seen in the past to go find stuff left behind by another attacker, but they know how to use it. Um, so we, we think we've seen uh, other bad guys do that. Hey, I'm going to go scan and look for a web shell. I know how to use it. I had nothing to do with this breach. Server's patch, but this server is now my server too. Um, so that's an interesting thing. And I will tie that into one final thing right after this OAB item I'll mention. Um, this didn't have a lot of attention. I think maybe someone has mentioned it by now, um, but we saw a lot of offline, and I said a lot, like maybe like you know less than 10% of the cases, um, of offline address book that. So um, kind of interesting is that they would use this whole auto discover and build this stuff, but they would go and request OAB.xml um, and they would get the specific path to download um, the encoded or the compressed 
um, offline address book. So most people, it, they are a separate things, but it, it is the address book or people typically would say, hey, it's the global address list. You know, it, it, they're, they're different things, but essentially what people think of, they're the same. It is the name, first name, last name, the email address, the title. It's like all the information about all the people that are kind of like in that email system. So, you know, kind of interesting, like, why do you need that if you can go in and fully breach the organization? I don't know, um, but it could potentially set the stage for future attacks or cracking or, um, you know, obviously even BEC scams because um, it has all this kind of data. Um, kind of one of the last things I will kind of end with, it's just uh, uh, just some general thoughts, was an interesting thing in the news if you hadn't heard about it. Um, but the United States um, Department of Justice, you know, FBI, uh, was able to get approval to go in. And uh, I honestly don't know, and actually I'm not you know, see exactly how they did it, but I believe they just knew a, kind of what the other slide alluded to. Hey, here's the different web shells. Here's how I can interact with them. Um, and they got court authorization and legally went in and removed web shells from organizations. Uh, I, I don't know if they had a number, but like thousands of organizations, um, which uh, I won't say it's unprecedented because I know the Dutch and other people have done things with botnets and stuff in the past. I know some stuff just recently happened with Emotet, but this is not a common thing to see people who are in a position to actually take action and kind of help people go out and actually do it. So it's kind of I'd say it's kind of fun. We think it's kind of cool. Uh, I know it's a can of worms. Some people could say exchange server sovereignty and was it violated? Um, but that stuff aside, it was nice to see the organization that potentially were sitting ducks for a future victimization. Potentially, um, you know, if they found everything or hadn't been, you know, lot moved through laterally, um, you know, potentially uh, saved or otherwise had, um, you know, a future compromise or future kind of detrimental breach. Um, you know, alleviated because of this. So it's just a, an interesting thing that, you know, I don't see too often um, and kind of just really wanted to use that as the last action. So in closing, kind of what we saw is a, a very stealthy targeted espionage attack kind of turned into like what, you know, hey, this, this cyber pandemic, right? It's globally disruptive, right? This cause is a huge deal, right? Um, you know, and you get the question, hey, is this better or worse than the solar winds? You know, th there's no right answer. There's no one of them is worse or better than the other. Obviously it impacted more organizations, but what caused more damage? What caused more theft? You know, I don't know. It's a, it's in a class of its own. Um, it's a very different type of, you know, it's not a supply chain issue, um, but uh, pretty interesting nonetheless. Um, and you say, hey, unfortunately, it's another case where, hey, it would be great if a patch could have occurred before wide exploitation. And it was very close, right? I mean, although it was you know, planned to be on, on March 9th, but it's just, you know, it's a case where, hey, patch did not come soon enough. Um, and, you know, you have to remember that patch only, you know, protects people from, new attacks and you can't count on the FBI to come in and uh, run a command to remove your web shell. So you, you kind of have to be proactive and pay attention to these things and, and work your way backwards. Uh, it kind of takes steps to look for, hey, have I been breached? Is there anything I can do um, you know, before uh, to take a look and say, hey, was I compromised before I patched? And you know, that's kind of, I guess, where we'll leave it. And I guess I will uh, you know, put some resources up in the screen. Uh, I, think, I think this is recorded and if people need the slides, I can share them later. Um, and if anyone wants to reach out with any questions or anything, I think we have a, a Q and A, um, and I will I also go to the I'll figure out how to get into the work adventure thing a little bit later. Uh, but you know, if you have stuff you know directly or later, um, feel free to uh, use this as well. Thank you, Steve. That was um, really really pretty awesome. I enjoyed that immensely. So so thank you very much for for doing that. Um, we have a couple of questions, and I've got some questions I'd like to throw at you. So so we'll start with the one that came one of the ones that came up. Quote, what is your estimate on the number of targets that might not have found and isolated the secondary activity? So people who've been hacked may have patched. So as you say, you know, the hole's gone, but they've been compromised in other ways. And are those vulnerabilities still there? Do you have any kind of gut feeling estimation on that? Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, I mean, the the numbers that were put out, you know, said that hundreds of, that hundreds of thousands were supposedly mm. places that were compromised prior to patching. And I would assume it just, the number probably grew a little, and it probably didn't grow as quickly, right? But it continued to grow. Um, maybe more is like, hey, after the patch and people start running those scripts, how many do you think are left? I'd say when people, we had a, a lot of engagements involving exchange servers for you know, about a month, but you know, mostly in the couple of weeks following the patch coming out. And I would say it's gotta be like, a lot of them had found something, but like the one, like I'd say 75, 80% plus had, uh, been victimized and had a web shell. How many of them were the tooling or their own discovery 
hadn't removed it, you know, some, I don't know, it's just off the top of my head, like 20, 25% of people were like, hey, I know something's going on. I ran tools and things, but there is still something there. So, I mean, it's a very significant number, right? I think even with all the, the outreach and knowledge, I mean, there's, there's easily thousands, there's not tens of thousands of servers, yeah. you know, still compromise, I would bet. Okay. The question I was going to throw, what, what was the biggest challenge you faced? And was it tech? Was it organization? Was it political? Was it government? Was it reaching out to other people what was the biggest challenge in that case yeah that's a good question uh, i mean initially it was like hey what you know what the hell's going on right like yeah. hey, that, like you know, what is it? it's, it's it's in different components right so before news going on hey something weird's going on it's not a good feeling from us to hey i think data is being stolen i can't even answer answer an explanation of like how or why um that was the first challenge obviously we sold that if you said use a timeline of it um you know basically within like four or five days um which is it's really good for what we had to work with um, next challenge, obviously, was um, you're a by you, you report this. It's serious. You know it's serious, but you're kind of like a bystander. i um, watching, like you know, I can't be like, "Hey, Microsoft, I need that patch on Friday." Like, let's get it going. Like, it, yeah, I, I, one, they would just, uh, you know, no one, no one wants to be talked to like that. But two, you know, you can't, you can't just tell, uh, "Hey, go patch this massive exchange product for all." And and we didn't know at the time that there's multiple other vulnerabilities kind of like in the works that they want to get addressed at the same time. So I did big challenges, um, you know, yeah, trying to know that we have to try and help our customers to protect things, but you're really not have a, I don't know if that's a challenge, but, you know, not have a say in the matter of like when this is basically resolved and wanting to be able to, you know, provide protection. But is, is there something, is there a better way of doing it? I mean, you know, sitting on your side of the fence, is there another way? Do, do you, what do you, what would you like them to do that they're not? Or, or do we, like yeah, I don't. I mean, I mean other than, yeah, say other than like you wish everything was quicker. I mean, obviously, hey, they put this out before <laughs> like February twenty fifth or twenty fourth or something like that. You know, we wouldn't, we potentially wouldn't be where we were on this scale. Um, so I, I don't know that I, you know, yeah, it, it's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Only, only other answer I think would kind of get me in trouble. So yeah, I got that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Was the standard logging and whatever that you saw on the exchange servers enough to help you do this? Yes. yes. My, so my history says, you know, you turn up and they're like, oh, we've got a week's logging and we overwrite and we don't keep anything. So that's it because that's the default. Yeah, we had some places that when I mentioned some like didn't have a lot, there were environments that had an extreme amount of data and they had like basically set retention lower because these files like, you know, an average record could be like, you know, I don't know, 800 meg. That file that's 800 meg or gig, it was like, you know, it's like 12 gigs a day at this organization. So they intentionally decreased, um, you know, retention right. for some of these cases. And they and, took a decision and, to do it on a risk management, whatever you want to call it. Right. Someone, yeah. So historically, it. yeah, historically, people haven't seen value. They, hey, they don't use these files very often. I don't know what they are. I don't know what they do. They've never been used. I Google them. They're not like a, a thing that people say, go throw in your SIM solution. Um, so, but by default, most of the places have a, a good amount of data so we can go back. So now if you were saying, hey, if your goal was, hey, in March, do I want to see, did I get the um, SSRF and was someone reading my email in January? Uh, some of those logs might not be there, but you might have IS, you, you might have, you might have some or you might have all of them. And you could probably answer at least potentially, was I targeted or did this happen? You may not know the whose email they were reading, you know, what individuals. But yeah, the logging is pretty solid out of the box. I mean, unless you turn it down, right. but obviously, you know, it doesn't last forever. So it depends on when you're looking as well. So. Okay. And in terms of advice that, you know, teams, whatever, can give their constituencies, is there anything they could have told them before this, you know, not knowing that this is going to come to so with hindsight, what could they have been doing that might have seen stop this happening? Yeah, I mean, to be completely because honest, like if you if you knew like the, the go button was about to be hit on, uh, say, like February 27, 28, um, and the patch was going to be March 2nd. Literally the only thing, and, and this is some of the advice we gave to you know some of our customers, but it's it's hard to uh, it's hard for people to swallow. What to do is is cut off you know hey cut off all external access you know or uh, yeah. you know we kind of said at first like OWA and in, in like EWS, but you know could they have gone through a different entry point um, through one of the other I don't know Mappy or, or some other method they could have uh, pushed it through. I don't know a hundred percent. I think if you cut off OWA and EWS or ECP, um, you're probably in pretty good shape. Um, but yeah, it would. It basically like, hey, you would have to cut this off. And it's like, you know, hey, globally, everyone turn off your email. You know, yeah, maybe email still comes in, the mail services. But it, yeah, it's not an easy thing. And it is a conversation we had with a number of people. And some people um, did do it or were prepping to do it. And um, right. that conversation was had a little more widely, basically, 
uh, you know, 12 or, you know, 14 hours before the patch was coming out. So, you know, a lot of people just opted to wait at that point, but most people didn't have right. any idea. Right. Attribution, you, you sort of talked about Microsoft did an attribution and we, you know, there were other ATPT groups mentioned. When I worked in this sort of space doing the incident response, people were always wanted to know who did it. It was always like, who did it? Who did it? Which, which people was it? And you're a bit like, does it really matter? Do, you know, in the big scheme of things, you get a patch, et cetera. Where yeah. do you sit on that one? I mean, attribution is an interesting one. Yeah, I straddle both sides of that thing sometimes. I mean, so in general, at Velocity, I mean, we have an idea, we have association like, hey, I think this is that group, or I know this is that group, and that group's believed to be out of country X or Y. Um, like true attribution, you know, yeah, I'm not over the keyboard, I'm not like the NSA, or I'm not the intelligence community, or I'm not the, um, you know, uh, in in the Netherlands, and I get into the, the camera system of a, of a Russian APT or something like I, we don't have that level of attribution. So we have like, mm. we surmise or we can guess and we're kind of, we try to be sometimes careful who we think it is. So if other people come out with better to have that more global visibility, so like a Microsoft and they name it, it's like, hey, that's kind of what we were thinking. Um, so in this particular case, hey, we had, like I said, there's a couple of things they did that made us think, oh, this is likely um, Chinese APT. Now, from our perspective as a defender, I want to solve it. That doesn't matter. From a, maybe I know their playbook um, or does the organization have an interest in who's stealing their data or wants to know the strategic, who would potentially taking this data and strategically using it or sharing it? I think it's useful from those. I don't necessarily know that most organizations, if they know it was country A versus B, that changes anything that they would do. Um, but I think if people can have the right to know, if, if you can give that answer to them, they have the right to make that decision on their own, but it's hard. Yeah, I get, yeah I, it, it's sort of a human wanting to know, but are you actually going to do anything based on it? Sometimes I wonder yeah. from the organization. Yeah, I, I think most don't, but it, you know, it all goes into, uh, it might calculate into some, you know, they, we also don't <laughs> know necessarily how all this information is always used, right? Like, I don't know if it, uh, just for negotiations or it could be you know, a product gets developed quicker you know it's not always tangible how it's used either so yeah, um, yeah. Well, another question popped up could traffic profile anomaly have been a workable detection yeah so i it, guess that's all this data is going out what the hell's going on right? yeah it kind of did it. so in a sense and in, maybe that's a, a little broader of a question than how it, so that's kind of actually how we detected it is a one form of anomaly being a, a large like a kind of like the byte transfer um now are there uh, better solutions that learn like, hey, the only time I ever see this type of activity is at these times. I, I think there are patterns like that if you're able to invest in that for your like environment, right? Like, hey, we don't really ever have large downloads or these activities outside of these hours or it involves these users. I, I think the answer to that is, the answer is obviously yes, because that's essentially the root of a very simplistic form of this data transfer, um, how we got it. I think if you have the time and the effort, and I think it's really more something that has to be customized and tweaked for an environment. I don't think it's something you can just go deploy everywhere. It won't scale like that. Won't work like someone that. fires up a new laptop without look on it and he's going to dump down a ton of data. So yeah, because yeah. you know those things like when you have so many false positives, the detection is like useless. Mm -hmm. People stop, like you don't care anymore. And we run into that alert fatigue and things that like we. Hey, I think this alert is useful, but I really have no way to like you know tune it down and. Um, when you tune it down, you can miss stuff. But I, so in general, I think the answer is yes. Do I have a, uh, but it's going to kind of like environment or certain, you know, even device specific. So, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. That's, that's fantastic. We're so we're slightly over time. I know we've got about 10 minutes or so before the break. So, so we'll call it a halt there. Stephen, thank you very much indeed. That was really, that was interesting and exciting. And I, I greatly enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone else did. So thanks thank you. That. Thanks. Thanks for it. coming in and speaking. And, and I hope to see you again soon. Yep, you too. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Look forward to seeing you in person. So. Yeah, that, oh, God, please, Jesus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, sir, did you have anything to say before we scoot into break? Sure. So thanks, Steve, for kind of the insight. It's, uh, I think you conveyed quite well how, how these things evolve. It's not like the Hollywood plot where everything kind of one step goes after the other. This is more like you, you kind of stumble onto the next thing and start wondering what is this about? And then, then it dawns on you. So I think you can rate this quite well. So I appreciate that very much.